Hey everybody, I'm Shauna and welcome back to my channel, Shauna Missy Me HD, where I strive to inform, encourage, and motivate you to achieve your educational goals by helping you gain admission into health-related undergrad and graduate programs. And today we are talking about medical school and CRNA school, and we're going to compare anesthesiology to CRNA, and you guys are in for a treat because I am going to be collaborating with Miss Portia. She is a current student in CRNA school, and she is going to provide some of her experience and knowledge about the field, and then you guys will be able to compare what she does to what I do. So I hope you guys enjoy this video. Um, before we get started, you guys know what to do. Go ahead and press the subscribe button and make sure you click the notification bell so that you are notified when I release the next video. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, don't get me started. My name is Portia and I am a second semester CRNA student at a university in South Florida and I'm currently in a 36 month DNAP program. I'm Shauna, if you don't know me. I am currently in my second year of residency, which is my first year of anesthesia residency. And I won't explain that right now. I will have a video that explains what that means. But anyway, I went to the University of Texas Health Science Center at Houston Medical School, also known as McGovern Medical School. Um, that is where I completed my medical education. And I also attended Texas Southern University uh, for my undergrad. I majored in biology. Sounds good. Okay, so today we're going to ask some questions to give you guys an understanding of the difference between the role of a CRNA, their schooling, um, and also how we both work together in the same profession. So we're going to start off by asking Shauna, what made you want to become an anesthesiologist? Um, so just a little background. I never really grew up wanting to become a doctor, period. Um, it's not something that I thought that I could actually do or not something I was used to seeing in my environment. So it wasn't necessarily a goal of mine. Um, I fell into an opportunity where I could go to med school. Everything ended up working out. I initially started med school wanting to be a OBGYN and um, I still love women's health, but um, I got pregnant or I decided to get pregnant in my third year of medical school. And I just happened to be on my anesthesia rotation while I was like in my last month of pregnancy. And I realized how, um, I guess, supportive the anesthesia community was to my pregnancy and my needs. Um, the job was like easy enough for me to do with a, you know, huge belly. Um, it was relaxed. It does get hectic and crazy sometimes, but for the most part, I was able to, you know, stay calm and, and relaxed. And it was really good for me um, not inducing, you know, early labor because of stress and stuff like that. Um, and so once I realized that I can like be a doctor, be in a, um, you know, nice profession, make a nice salary and also still um, pursue my plans as far as, you know, building a family and having kids and stuff like that. Um, I knew anesthesia was was probably one of the um, only fields that I would like to go into outside of OBGYN and anesthesia, I liked emergency medicine. So uh, once I did my OBGYN rotation and I saw how hectic it is and like the hours, the call hours are crazy. I uh, I had already had my baby when I did my uh, OBGYN rotation and she was about one or two months. And I literally spent the entire six weeks of that rotation pretty much not seeing her at all. I would go to work before she woke up and I would get home after she already went to bed. And I knew that that type of lifestyle wasn't for me. And maybe it was just a bad month. It was a bad rotation, a bad hospital. I don't know, but I wasn't, I wasn't down for all that. So I was like, well, anesthesia it is. <laughs> and that's pretty much how I chose. Oh, so I chose CRNA. Um, actually it's funny because I wanted to become a nurse practitioner in women's health as well. Um, but when I started nursing school, that changed because I, I fell in love with cardiac. So my plan was to become a cardiac nurse. But when I graduated, the opportunity for cardiac didn't come until later. Well, I thought it didn't come, but I ended up working on a neural floor, became a neuro ICU nurse and um, decided to go CRNA route because same thing as you as far as hectic hours, nurse practitioners work all the time they chart at the hours they're on call they work weekends <laughs> listen that wasn't for me uh, -uh. I, I don't have children now but i do plan to have kids and i want to enjoy my children exactly. um, and plus nurse practitioners have lots of patients they can go to different hospitals 
clinics and they have patients all day. A CRNA has one patient at a time. Once I clock out, that's it. Don't call me about anything. Right. <laughs> that's it. And um, to me, CRNA school was more of, it was more interesting. Like um, the medications, putting people to sleep and waking them up, like that, that sweet line between life and death. It's mm-hmm. just very, um, to me, it's just very, it's just exercise for the brain. It just keeps you, you going. And I also have a video about that on my channel. It goes more into detail. But that's why I chose CRNA um, over nurse practitioner. Okay, so now we're going to talk about, let's discuss the roles. What is the role of anesthesiologist compared to, and then I'll talk about the role of a CRNA. So I honestly don't know what the, if there is a huge difference from my understanding, from what I'm experiencing now in the OR as an anesthesia resident, um, the primary role of the anesthesiologist is to provide anesthetic care to the patient. And for my followers uh, who don't know what that means, pretty much uh, provide medical management to a patient when they are sedated, unconscious, and paralyzed, which means they are not able to breathe for themselves. They don't think for themselves. They can't move. They can't, you know, close their eye to protect their eyes. So the anesthesiologist does all of that along with the help of medications in the ventilator to make sure the patient stays safe during surgery. So that is the main role of the anesthesiologist. And you also have to include the pre-op evaluation, making sure the patient is safe to undergo surgery in the first place and what what management do you need to include to make sure that whatever um, current conditions they have, you're able to manage those throughout surgery. And then also post-operative care, uh, making sure the patient wakes up safely, nothing went wrong, you know, any follow-up labs or imaging or whatever um, until it's time for the patient to move on to the next stage of care. Absolutely. That's the same role that we have as well. Uh, we do a pre-op assessment, plan of care, medical history, um, uh, plan for intra-op, what kind of medications, depending on the surgery, uh, depending on the patient's medical history, can you even take certain medications? Exactly. Yeah. Um, letting the patient know, okay, before surgery, don't take this medication. After surgery, wait a certain amount of time before doing this, pain management. So I feel like um, it's... Uh, we have the same role um, for the most part. Our, our profession is anesthesia, caring mm-hmm. for the patient before, during, and after, um, and educating the patient and the family on what is happening throughout each process. So very similar roles. So <laughs> it can be a bit confusing sometimes, but very, very similar. Talk about a typical clinical day for yourself. A typical clinical day would look like this. So basically I would wake up around 5 a.m. I have a child, so I have to consider a uh, time for that. But I get to work about 6.30 a.m. Um, first thing I do is double check the surgery board to make sure the assignment that I received the night before is still the same. It's the same case, the same patient, and in the same operating room. Once I do that, then I will go and see the patient, pretty much go over everything that Ms. Portia just said about the history, medical history, making sure that the plan that I have set is the plan that is gonna actually happen. And I have to run things over with the attending physician, the anesthesiologist to make sure that he or she signs off on what I wanna do or if I need to change any of my management. Because again, residency is a training uh, program, which means I don't know what I'm doing. I'm learning, right? So. Um, I have to include that in a part of my clinical day, which is running things by the anesthesiologist. Um, Most cases at my hospital start at 730, so I have to be ready to roll back to the OR uh, around that time. And in between seeing the patient and rolling back to the OR, I have to go to the OR to get everything set up. And set up usually includes um, your machines, making sure you have gas ready and available, making sure your machine works. Um, everything that you need for the airway because again the machine breathes for the patient so we have to put things into the patient to make sure they receive that oxygen so having your airway stuff ready having your medications ready and having any other emergency things that you may need if you if a patient all of a sudden becomes uh, hypotensive which is low blood pressure they may need 
IV fluids as quick as possible. So making sure we have IVs ready to go. And if the patient doesn't have an IV, I have an IV kit ready to go to place an IV. So there's a lot of preparation and you pretty much do that over and over and over throughout the, throughout the day for different patients until it's time for you to go. And in residency, we usually have a schedule where we have a pre-call day, which you get off around 3 p.m. at the latest, hopefully, uh, a regular day where you get off at 5, a post-call day where you're off because you've been on call the day before, and then a, a late call day where you stay until 7 p.m. So it would be maybe an average of three to five or six cases throughout the day. Okay. So a typical clinical day for an sRNA, um, same thing. You have to usually get your, your cases the day before. So you go in that morning. Um, it's, it would depend on which hospital. You also have to do a pre-op assessment before as well. Um, so you go in and you make sure that, well, depending on your preceptor, you have to um, come up with a plan of care, uh, answers your plan the night before for each patient. And you go in and you see the chart. You, compare the schedule to what you have. Same thing as Shauna said, you have to check your, do your machine check, make sure your medications are there, make sure there aren't, um, the seals aren't broken on medications, you have your needles. I am, a, I'm not OCD, but I like to label stuff. So make sure you have your pen <laughs> to label everything. Make sure you have all the equipment. And the thing about anesthesia is some hospitals have different anesthesia machines each per room. We have, have three, three different machines at our hospital. Oh, wow. <laughs> it is annoying when you're learning. Yeah. <laughs> and so you found your precepts, you go over your plan, and you pretty much, depending on what stage you're in. Um, so for, CRN, for SRNAs, so the longer we do clinical, by the time we graduate, we should be working independently, meaning that our preceptors should be able to not be standing over us for our cases. That is the the goal for for clinicals for us so pretty much the same thing again <laughs> okay, right same thing okay so speaking of school um can you do like a quick rundown of if someone wants to go to medical school to do anesthesia how would they go about doing that so and i just want to like say this first because i get this question so much there is no particular undergraduate major that you need to pursue in order to become any specific type of doctor. If you want to be a doctor in general, whether it's family medicine, surgeon, anesthesia, dermatologist, it doesn't matter what it is, you can major in anything in college. There's nothing that says if I major in this in college, it's going to set me up for anesthesia or it's going to set me up for surgery. That is not a real thing. I don't know where people got that from, okay? So to become a doctor, you have to get a bachelor's degree. Well, to be technical, all you need is 90 credits to get accepted into medical school, but because of how competitive it is, most people apply with a degree. You have to be like a freaking genius to be able to get into med school with only 90 credits. But anyway, you can do it. Um, so you go, to, you go to college, you get a four year degree, and then you apply to medical school. Again, you can have any major that you want. Be sure to have a GPA that is competitive. Most people say at least a 3.5. That's what I say if you're considering both DO schools and MD schools. And if you don't know the, if you don't know the difference between MD and DO, I have a video that you can uh, check out that kind of compares the two. But um, traditionally, DO schools are known for having um, less competitive admission requirements. So I say aim for smack dead in the middle. A 3.5 can get you into an MD school and definitely get you into a DO school. Also, the big scare factor is the MCAT. It is the medical college admissions test. Um, all professional programs require some type of entrance exam uh, for medical school. It's the MCAT. The average right now is a 511. And um, that's the average amongst all applicants. But a lot of my followers, subscribers are minorities. And so I do talk about the average MCAT scores for minorities. So check out that video if you want to know what that is. But obviously having a good GPA, um, a good MCAT score, strong letters of recommendation, any type of clinical experience you can get. And if you can't get clinical experience, regular work experience is good too, okay? You just need to emphasize that it has built teamwork, leadership, character, whatever you want to call it, all of that is good, okay? So that's pretty much how you get to med school. 
Okay, good. So CRNA requirements is a little bit different. So you have to have your BSN, the Bachelor in Nursing of Science, and then you have to do at least a year in an ICU. Um, the ICU experience all depends on the school. Some schools prefer two years, some will take one year. Some schools will not take PD ICU and others will. So whatever school you're interested in, you have to see what they will take. But you do a year in the ICU at the least, and that is your time to get used to the medications that we give, titrating the medications and assessing your patients on those medications. Also, CRNA school is very competitive, so you have to have a strong uh, chemistry and biology background. Overall, GPA used to be a thing. Like, whenever I first started to apply, I just kept hearing about a 3738, um, and so that discouraged me for a while. But I always had a strong chemistry and bio background, so I apply anyway. I have a master's in a different field, too. Um, so the GPA requirement overall isn't as strong as it used to be, as long as you have a well-rounded um application but you must have a strong chemistry and bio background a strong i mean ma mainly a's okay um <laughs> and you have, some schools require gre and others don't um so uh, that's pretty much the requirement for crna school and also a shadowing you have to shadow a crna and or anesthesiologist at least 20 hours um before applying to crna school I'm glad you brought those last two points because I want to make emphasis on when becoming a uh, or trying to go to med school to become a doctor. You don't shadowing is not required. Um, you don't have to have you don't even have to have clinical experience. If you are able to uh, flex on other parts of your resume, uh, other other things you participated in or whatever, they'll take that. They want to see a well-rounded uh, applicant, but. If you have the opportunity to shadow, shadow. If you can get clinical experience as a scribe or volunteering or something in a hospital or a clinic, do it. It just makes you look better. And then also, uh, med schools do not look at particular grades for your science courses. You do have to have at least a C average in all of your um, science and math courses. But you don't have to like make A's. They're not gonna look at your transcript and be like, oh, she got a C in chemistry. We ain't, we ain't taking her. You know what I mean? They're just gonna look at your overall science GPA and then your overall GPA and make sure you've passed all of your science courses. But when science background is important for the MK, so a lot of people stress doing well in your science courses for your own personal gain and your own personal benefit for the MK. So that is what the Science Foundation is stressed about for pre-med students. And then obviously you want to be able to survive in med school. So you want to know a little bit about chemistry and physics and biology and stuff before you get to med school. So I just wanted to make that clear. Yeah, exactly. I hope that you guys enjoyed that video. Also, this is part one of two parts. So make sure you stick around for part two.